Hello, everyone. My name is Pete Karamanis. I'm a member of the advisory board of the TomTom Tom Foundation and a founding member of the Charlottesville law firm, Royer Karamanis. On behalf of our board and our team, I wanna thank you each for being here. Today's event is part of a seven week virtual event series called the Cities Rising Summit. Cities Rising will explore critical issues surfaced by the COVID-19 pandemic and movement for racial justice, especially as they relate to small and mid-sized cities in America. All Cities Rising events will be available on a pay what you can basis. Thanks to the support of our sponsors and community members like you. If today's program resonates with you, please consider becoming a contributing member to the foundation. You can do so on our website, tomtomfoundation.org slash give. The Cities Rising Summit will run until October 30th, and we encourage you to get as involved as possible over the course of the coming weeks. Join us at weekly meet and greets and interactive change maker sessions. Connect on our Slack workplace and please email our team anytime with questions and feedback. All talks through Cities Rising will be recorded. So if you enjoy today's session, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and share it with colleagues and friends. Please note the chat function at the bottom of your screen. You can use that to connect with other participants on the call today and share your own experience around these issues. Also, please note the Q&A function. You can use that to ask questions of our speakers. Our moderator will have the, their eyes on that channel and will include your questions and insights into how they steer today's conversation. The title of today's talk is Dismantling the Punishment Bureaucracy and features Alec Karakatsanis, who has led landmark legislative efforts to challenge money bail across the American South and who is a fierce advocate for rethinking critical aspects of our criminal legal system. Today's event is part of a week of programs centered around criminal justice reform and is brought to you by Seville Weekly, who we thank for their incredible support and collaboration. With that, I'm pleased to introduce you to our moderator for today, Chaz Moore, Executive Director of the community-based racial justice group, Austin Justice Coalition, and an incredible agent of change based in Austin, Texas. Chaz, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. Um, glad to be a part of Tom Tom again. Wish we could be there, but you know, 2020. Um, and of course, I'm really excited to be here with Alec Karakastanis. I hope I said that right. I'm gonna let him introduce himself and then we'll get started. Thanks, Chaz and Pete and Ben and uh, everyone at TomTom Tom for, for having this. I was so much looking forward to doing this in person. Uh, and it's, it's, as Chaz said, it's, it's, a, it's a sign of the times that we're on a Zoom call together. <laughs> um, I just finished doing a Zoom call to uh, a bunch of uh, policymakers and judges and prosecutors and public defenders in Virginia. So Virginia is on my mind today. I hope we can talk a little bit about stuff that's most relevant to you all in Virginia. So if there are folks in the chat that want to ask questions that are Virginia specific, that would also be great too. Um, my name is Alec. I'm the founder of Civil Rights Corps, which is a nonprofit civil rights organization based in Washington, D.C. Uh, as as um, you know, Pete mentioned, we've been going around the country uh, filing constitutional civil rights challenges to the money bail system, to the ways that courts extract wealth from impoverished communities through fines and fees, to prosecutor misconduct, to police brutality and violence. Um, but we have a, a sort of a broader goal. And the broader goal is to, is to attack the, the white supremacist and um, uh, wealthist uh, foundations of the criminal punishment bureaucracy and to expose them and to, and to work with organizers and directly impacted people and, and artists and musicians and, and poets and, and many other people to really change the way that our culture thinks about human caging. Um, we live in a time of unprecedented human caging. And so our organization is really trying in, in many different ways to, to ask, how did it become so normal to put so many people in cages? And, and how do we get out of that cultural mindset? How do we attack some of the economic and, and, and racial undertones um, that, that led to that normalization? So I'm looking forward to chatting a little bit with you today, Chaz, about all that. Absolutely. Um, and we hope you know people learn as much from this as, as humanly possible. And if you have questions, please share them. Um, in the chat and on YouTube, and we'll, we'll try to get them um, to Alec. Um, so first, let's just set the stage, right? Let's jump right into it. Um, 
um, you know, you've done a lot of work, you've done a lot of research and writing around this. Um, so how does our criminal legal system currently reinforce race and wealth-based systems of power? Who is responsible for upholding or challenging those systems of power? And how does this tie to community health and economic mobility? So I think the system reinforces uh, a history of both white supremacy and, um, and sort of wealth accumulation, particularly white wealth accumulation um, in, in multiple ways. You know, the first way is what does the system even call a crime? How does it determine what's criminal? You know, so for example, um, when setting up a society, you could decide to make it criminal to possess certain plants or you could decide to make it not criminal to possess certain plants. You could decide to make it criminal to organize with fellow workers to form a union, or you could decide to make it criminal to stop workers from organizing for a union, so on and so forth. Um, so all throughout the, this country and all throughout this country's history, people who have power have at various times um, just decided what's criminal and what's not. So one example you know, more recently was up until the, the 90s, and, uh, until President Bill Clinton's um, uh, administration, it was a, a crime to do certain types of betting on certain companies and, and, and what has now become sort of legalized derivative trading market or at least large components of that market. A lot of very wealthy people paid a lot of money to politicians and, and various think tanks and they ended up changing that law to make it perfectly legal to do a lot of the types of derivatives trading that later then led to the financial crisis. So um, what might be gambling for some people so it's still illegal um, in most places in the country for poor people to wager over dice in the streets, uh, but it's perfectly legal for uh, billionaire investors to wager over international currencies or to wager over the global supply of wheat, um, even though um, speculation over the wheat supply could lead to the starvation of millions and has led to, to, um, to uh, famine all over the world uh, at various times. So, I don't want to give any you know, more examples than that, but just when you think about all of the things that are criminalized in society, whether it's um, a homeless person sleeping outside or the so-called war on drugs, which criminalize certain substances, but not others. Um, think about, for example, how tobacco kills 450,000 Americans every year, legal. Um, marijuana doesn't kill anyone uh, and illegal. Um, so um, that's a little bit oversimplified, um, but, the, the main point is that the first way that the system does this and reinforces uh, uh, those, those sort of histories uh, and those architectures of oppression is by defining what's criminal. The second way it does it is given what's criminal, um, how do we decide where to look for those crimes and who to prosecute for them? So for example, it's criminal to possess marijuana or cocaine, um, but in the District of Columbia where I live, um, traditionally over the last 30 years, Black people have been um, using cocaine and marijuana in lower rates than white people, but have been 95 to 98% of the people arrested for it. So the second way the system reinforces this is, is um, who is it targeting? When you look at the, at the criminal punishment bureaucracy and the prison system in this country, we cage black people at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid. This system of mass incarceration isn't random. It's being selectively applied in certain neighborhoods to certain people some of the time for some things. And so um, whether that's um, the fail utter failure to enforce crimes uh, against corporations for environmental pollution or the failure to, um, to enforce uh, sexual assault laws on university campuses or the failure to, afford under to enforce dr underage drinking laws on university campuses. In, in, in the book that I've, I've recently written, Usual Cruelty, I go through a whole list and hundreds of examples of this to really give you a flavor of how the entire, uh, what's called law enforcement, I don't use that term because that term signifies some kind of objectivity that like when a law is broken, it is enforced. When in fact, um, almost never when a law is broken, is it ever enforced. And police are making very political, very racially motivated decisions about where they're enforcing laws and when. So the second answer to your question is, um, given what's a crime, who do we prosecute for it? And then I think um, the, the sort of third area, um, just broadly speaking, is um, what kinds of, of punishments and what kinds of responses does our society um, give to certain crimes? So um, in the opioid um, epidemic, for example, um, a lot of politicians have said, we need, to, we need to treat people. We need to 
give them access to the things that are going to help them get better, right? Whereas in the crack epidemic, so-called crack epidemic, um, the response was, we need to cage as many people as possible, separate as many Black families as possible for an entire generation. And we need to surveil and punish and stop and frisk everyone we can in that entire neighborhood, right? Two very different responses based on, um, in my opinion, different racial demographics of who is associated with abuse of certain types of, of drugs. Now, even those, those stereotypes were actually wrong. Um, white people actually used crack and still use crack in higher numbers than black people. Um, and the opioid epidemic is, a, is, is ravaging black communities as well. Um, but the, that was sort of the, the racialized popular narrative. And so when our society confronts a problem, like let's say um, gender-based violence, um, one of the ways that it reproduces all these systems is it says the solution to gender-based violence is incarceration, police, probation officers, handcuffs, tasers, squad cars, sirens, um, and not, you know, sort of confronting economic inequality and toxic masculinity, and not sort of like um, providing resources for people that are directly impacted by, by, by that, that sort of um, social construct and, and, and violent um, behavior to actually like extricate themselves from that situation. And so our society perpetuates all of this by the types of things that it does to respond to certain kinds of harm. I'll just stop there in, in case that there's, you know, a follow up that you want. If I didn't get to your question. No, no, no. I, I think you did good. Um, I, and I think you did really good at, at answering what, uh, what upholds this, the current system. But I also want to see um, or I want you to, to chime in on who do you think should challenge these systems, right? Because, you know, I, I think as a, as an organizer and as a black organizer, um, I'm quickly realizing that it's, it's the people that um, are not harmed the most that have the most privilege that should do the heavy lifting. So I just want to see who you think in terms of um, this, this sick carceral state, who should be doing the heavy lifting to make sure we can get the changes that we like, not want, but just need. Yeah, that's such an important question. So I, I would say two things. First, um, it's absolutely clear that the people that created this punishment bureaucracy are not going to be the ones that help us solve it. Um, the people who benefit from it should not be the ones in power deciding how to fix it. And that's what I think is so dangerous about most of what is called criminal justice reform right now. It's the same politicians and the same economic interests that created this entire punishment bureaucracy that are the ones that are now calling themselves reformers and proposing a lot of solutions that actually will do nothing to disrupt the, the core uh, fundamental flaws of the system. So any movement to, to dismantle the system needs to be led by the people who are most directly impacted by that system because those are the people who, who, who can convey what kind of horrors that system has brought to them and their families and their communities. At the same time, um, these are communities that are being preyed upon in many, many different ways, whether it's um, predatory lending, whether it's um, uh, uh, wage theft, which is another un completely unprosecuted, uninvestigated area. But um, the amount of wage theft that goes on by employers to over poor employers, particularly employees, particularly Black uh, and, and Latinx uh, workers in this country, is by conservative estimates between 50 and 100 billion dollars a year, uh, between five and 10 times all other theft, robbery, burglary combined. Um, and it's never prosecuted by the white power establishment um, and the political establishment that's really dominated by, by corporate interests. So, um, so at the same time, those are communities that are heavily targeted and very vulnerable. And so um, there are many aspects of doing the work in this movement that we need to ask, how can we support you? How can we help you do the work with you leading it um, that will dismantle these systems? Not how can we put all of the work on you as the people that helped create, you know, lawyers in particular helped build this entire system. We wrote all of these laws. Um, we are the ones prosecuting you. We're the ones judging you, right? So lawyers in particular need to take a, a step back and, and, and think about how can we offer our limited set of legal skills in service of a movement that is led by um, people who are directly impacted by these systems? No, I th yeah, I think this, I think that's perfect. Um, so, so let's let's talk 2020 and, and COVID-19, um, which is th this has to be one of the worst years in human history, right? This is like this is like see the last season of Game of Thrones um, in real life. It's just that bad. Um, 
So what impact has COVID-19 had on, um, you know, in, in, on, the, on the prison and jail systems? Um, what, what practices are you aware of um, have changed as a result of the pandemic? Um, and have any of these changes um, resulted in, in, in longer lasting policy changes, um, either in your opinion or, or in what you see? That's such an important question, Chaz. I, I, I want to first preface by saying um, COVID has been obviously incredibly disruptive and devastating for everyone globally. Uh, it is particularly horrific for people in jail and prison um, because they're dealing with all of the stress of um, how are my loved ones feeling? How are they doing? How are they coping? Um, but they also can't be there with them. Um, Moreover, they are trapped in environments with terrible ventilation um, and no control over whether they come into contact with people who are sick. And so it's been no surprise that, that the virus has spread like wildfire throughout uh, this country's jails and prisons. One of the things that we did early on in the pandemic was we started representing people in jails across the country, we represented everybody in, in the Chicago jail and the Miami jail, Detroit, Houston, Dallas, Los Angeles. Um, PG County here outside DC, Oakland County, Michigan, outside Detroit. And we brought all these cases on behalf of all of the human beings who were detained in these jails because um, the, the, by and large, um, prisons and jails were just letting the virus run its course inside. You know, and, and in, in the weeks after we filed the Chicago case, just to take one example, seven people died in the Cook County jail from COVID. Um, and so, um, right now, as you and I are talking, still um, uh, as a response uh, to, to the COVID pandemic, um, rather than releasing people, um, jails and prisons across the country have resorted to really horrific things like solitary confinement. So there are 300,000 people right now, this moment, in solitary confinement um, around this country. That is about five times what we think of as the daily solitary confinement average in this country. Keep in mind, we already had the most people in solitary confinement of any country in the recorded history of the modern world. The United Nations considers it to be torture, but you're stuck in a, a concrete box with, for 23 hours a day. Your other one hour a day is you're taken to a little bit larger concrete room and told you can walk around in circles. Um, imagine what that does to you. And it's not like you have books or other things available to you or people you can be interacting with. Um, it's absolute madness. And um, that's what's happening right now because of the COVID pandemic for 300,000 people in our jails and prisons. And it's just, it's just unspeakable. Um, now, uh, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, uh, almost nothing was done by public officials to reduce prison population. Um, very, very little, statistically insignificant. Um, we saw much more success reducing local jail populations uh, in many places. However, um, in answer to your question of whether that's any kind of long lasting reform, it was our hope that this moment would, would get people to think about our jails more broadly as places of infectious disease. I mean, they already are places where you're extraordinarily likely to contract infectious disease, to be sexually and physically assaulted. Um, but um, it turns out that much of the reduction in, in the jail population had to do with just the police making fewer arrests. And so um, what we've unfortunately been seeing all over the country in, in, in every jurisdiction is the jail population slowly rising again um, as, as police departments have, have started to make more and more arrests. And, and we have not really seen fundamental changes to the way that mass incarceration bureaucracy functions in any major jurisdiction. And so I fear, um, we were just talking to the, to the sheriff in, in Houston, Texas, which where we have a big uh, constitutional bail challenge there, and he's projecting astronomical increases in the jail population unless, unless we do something uh, drastic. And that's very scary. Three or four people have already died in the Harris County Jail uh, from COVID, um, and many, many, many more people have gotten sick. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic that, that the COVID pandemic has led to any real reckoning in our society at all about um, what our jails and prisons look like. So, so, so can we explain to the people that, <clears throat> like me, like, you, you know, for me, it's like, I understand, um, or the way things operate in my very simple mind is, 
<laughs> is if something is bad, let's just fix it. Um, it shouldn't be harder than that, right? But like, can you explain to the people that are watching and viewing, um, what are some of the barriers on the state and federal level that um, disallow us to make the changes we need um, to either one, improve um, the, the state of jails and prisons or to reduce the populations to zero? And just get rid of them completely. Like, like, what are the barriers in place? Why are we not able to make the changes we need? And I know that's a big question. So, like, yeah, yeah. So, in some respects, the answer to that is, you know, what are the barriers to ending uh, U.S. imperialism abroad and to ending economic inequality in the U.S.? I mean, of course, there's a a ruling class elite of people who own things who are very interested in keeping society looking very close to what it currently looks like. And those people have a tremendous amount of power that they exert through their ownership of all of the major media outlets in this country, through their ownership of most of the property in this country, um, through their control of the political system. So um, uh, that's maybe a little bit less interesting for this discussion because that's just general stuff that prevents um, problems like um, racism and poverty from ever getting dealt with in this country because of the, the people who really control most of the, the way this country works. But specifically to the criminal system, I think it's important to unpack that just a little bit. Um, and I think there are several major barriers. You know, one general overarching barrier is that most of the public has absolutely no understanding of what's going on in the criminal system and no understanding of how bad it is. And so that's partially because they've been so heavily propagandized either by the local news media, the national news media, you know, constantly running mug shots of, of black men um, talking about crime and as if police have some connection to crime, um, which in my view they don't. And I've, I've written something about that recently. Um, the, the way the media talks about crime is both um, heavily racialized and, and class-based. You know, the media is talking about certain kinds of crime committed by certain kinds of people and ignoring large swaths of what is technically legally a crime. Um, so there's a, there's a, a real need uh, for all of us to do some um, education of the general public about what the criminal system is, what harms it causes, and also how ineffective it is. And that's where I think, in particular, the voices of people who've been impacted by the system and their families, the tens of millions of people who have a, a loved one behind bars, who have a loved one on a GPS ankle monitor right now, right? Um, those are the stories that we need to be telling and talking about. The second you know, big structural barrier, I think, is uh, organized political interest in, in service of the mass incarceration bureaucracy. Very similar to like the military industrial complex, there's an entire constellation in every local city of people who depend on the punishment system for their job. It's police officers and probation officers and parole officers and prosecutors and public defenders and judges and clerks. And then it's all of the people who, who make all of, you know, make the handcuffs and the sirens and the tasers and the guns and the bulletproof vests. Um, and there's this entire local sort of political apparatus that's been set up to, to, to depend on this bureaucracy. Like any bureaucracy, once you create it and build it, it's very hard to take it back, right? Um, and so that's one reason why um, police unions have so much power um, in every single local jurisdiction. Um, and then, uh, you know, another um, sort of entrenched interest is the, the, the corporate profit that we're seeing throughout the punishment bureaucracy. Every single aspect of the criminal punishment system has been privatized for profit. Um, you've heard about private prisons, you know, they've gotten a lot of media attention. But what people don't realize is in all of the public jails and prisons around the country, everything inside them is privatized. The food delivery, the medical care, the phone calls, you know, you can pay $25 if you're a poor person, you have to be $25 <clears throat> for a 15 minute phone call with loved ones. Um, and, and the same multi-billion dollar companies that own those interests also are now buying up all of the GPS monitoring and surveillance industry because as Michelle Alexander has written in the New York Times, the next frontier is this e-carceration, right? Um, we're gonna have the same or slightly fewer people in prisons and we're gonna have way more people on some kind of monitoring device. The government's gonna be watching their every movement and limiting where they can go um, and surveilling them 
in ways that have been uh, unheard of 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. So at every single turn, um, someone is making money off of um, what's happening in the criminal punishment system. And, and those powerful interests, because of how corrupted our political system has become, um, they control a lot of the policy that's made in this area. Those are the barriers in a nutshell. Yeah, and that, that was a very um, a quick nutshell. And I encourage people to, to read more about this and read Alex's um, book if you haven't. Um, you briefly mentioned policing, which is where I want to go next, because this is my, um, like, this is the thing that, that we do quite well here in Austin. Um, I'm just kicking the police ass. Um, so I, I, I want to ask this question, and I don't want you to think of reforms in a way um, that we traditionally do, right? Because I think, you know, we see in 2020, the community um, at large, at least, is like really tired of reforms. Um, and when I think reform, I think of like the 94 crime bill, right? And, and like how many people thought that was this revolutionary thing when it was one of the worst things that ever happened um, in the criminal justice system and for the black community. But what are some of the fundamental reforms that um, need to take place to reimagine public safety? Um, and what are ways to look out for the current system um, um, recreating itself, right? Because I think, um, I tell people all the time, right? You know, if, if we want to burn a system down, okay, let's do that. But if we are internally bringing racism and misogyny and homophobia with us, we'll just recreate the wheel, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. Like, what are some reforms? Or let's just say changes, right? Like, like, what are some radical reforms? What are some radical changes needed um, to get to a system of public safety that doesn't um, solely, well, that doesn't rely on punitive measures and a carceral state? I think this is really the critical question now. And, and a lot of us who, who think of ourselves as abolitionists um, are actually, um, you know, much more engaged in the, in the process of building than we are tearing down. Um, what kinds of alternate um, ways of thinking and alternate structures need to be put in place so that a society doesn't need or doesn't think it needs um, any of the carceral um, uh, architecture and, and, and tools that it's been employing for so long. So I'll just give a few examples. You know, um, I think number one, we need to change the mentality that um, a response, when someone causes somebody harm, that person needs to have pain inflicted on them. This, this idea of punishment um, is actually divorced from any notion of what would lead to less harm in the future. It's also, um, um, divorced from any notion of, of humanity. We all make mistakes and we all do bad things and we all hurt people. Um, and we, I think it's very important to, instead of thinking about punishing people, think about understanding how that harm happened, how they can repair that harm to the person that they've hurt or people that they've hurt, um, and how we can build the systems that ensure that that kind of harm happens less. So let me be more specific, right? Um, the current punishment system um, does very, very little for people who've been victimized by a crime. It doesn't offer them um, the, the kind of meaningful um, engagement, um, the, the kind of reparations that they're owed. Um, it doesn't offer them, uh, most importantly, a community where that kind of harm is less likely to happen. And so that's why I'm very interested in what people call restorative justice or transformative justice. Um, I would point everyone listening to an incredible website called transformharm.org, which is curated by the visionary thinker, Maryam Kaba, K-A-B-A, -A, and that's transformharm.org. And, and that site collects a number of podcasts, videos, essays, articles, and stories about answering Chaz's question in, a, in ways that are way more profound than I could ever do it. And you can look through all of the, the things on that website. Um, and, and, and really what it's getting at is, what do some of these alternate mentalities look like? And, and so uh, what restorative justice does is it brings together the person who has harmed and the person who is harmed, um, often with other people that both of them trust from their community. And they have a restorative process that holds the person accountable. The person who's been harmed talks about what they need and the person who, who harmed talks about what they can give. Um, and um, the, the data around this um, um, is astonishing. Um, People who, who, um, who, who have harmed um, go on to harm way less. 
um, than the traditional criminal punishment system. People who have been harmed um, report way higher levels of satisfaction with the process because it's actually doing something that our society has been um, uh, eliminating, which is it's creating bonds between human beings and creating community and building relationships. A healthy society where people feel connected to each other and in relationship with each, with each other is one where people are hurting each other less. So, um, you know, that's one thing. The second thing is we need to, to confront. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to really eliminate or dramatically reduce the criminal punishment bureaucracy if we don't confront the, I think, two um, sort of driving forces of that system. And that is a history of white supremacy and a history of, of wealth hoarding. Um, because most of the system is really designed to preserve people's wealth. Um, it's it's the, the main function of police throughout history. Um, uh, at the key points when police forces started metastasizing was catching um, enslaved people who had run away um, and busting union action by low wage workers, mostly immigrant workers. And so uh, modern police forces grew out of that history. And, and if you look, there's an unbroken line to the present. The main function that police serve is if I have a, if I have a, a home or four homes or six homes or 10 extra bedrooms, um, and my family took this, this land and this wealth um, through a variety of, of discriminatory and exploitative and brutal acts um, throughout the 18. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, um, and now I own all this stuff, I can call someone with a gun and metal chains to keep you away um, from my stuff, the stuff that I own. And at a fundamental level, that's what police really do. Um, everybody uh, in the community understands that they are there to preserve the things of people who own them. And so until we address the underlying inequities in the distribution of who owns things in this country, I actually don't think um, the ruling class and the people who control the police, so in most cities that's the property developers and the gentrifiers and, and, and the moneyed interests, I don't think that they're going to let the police um, dramatically change what they do. And the second piece of that, of course, is, is the racial component. Until we've reckoned with why do our neighborhoods look the way that they look, um, why, why is the wealth distribution so heavily racialized? Um, wh why do, do uh, does every single institution in our society um, discriminate on the basis of race, um, subconsciously and consciously? Um, I don't think we have any chance because the, 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 throughout its entire history, the criminal system has been used by white police to criminalize and control um, black bodies and black families. And so whether it's the war on drugs, which separated tens of millions of black families and, and, and confined uh, tens of millions of black families to poverty into a cycle of debt and incarceration, or whether it's, it's you know, uh, the tactics that were used in the uh, Jim Crow South. Um, there's a great book called Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman, which describes how the Southern uh, uh, states basically reproduced uh, the system of slavery through a system of convict leasing using the criminal justice system. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. I, I think that what we need to do is build other structures. Um, so the things that I'm most excited about, Chaz, around the country are things like um, invest, cities investing, using their municipal purchasing power to invest in things like worker-owned co-ops by people who are formerly incarcerated, by people who've been heavily policed, and directing city contracts to those kinds of businesses because that builds economic power and political participation at the same time. I'm interested in community land trusts, um, carving out and setting aside land ownership for, for, for people in the community who, who had their wealth extracted through redlining and, and a variety of other <clears throat> racist practices. Um, and, then, and then linking the, the building of, 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 of land ownership and, and worker-owned um, cooperatives to um, uh, communities that have been targeted by the police and, and formerly incarcerated. Those are the, the types of things that I think have the most potential. So I, I, so I want to I want to park right here for just a second, um, just because I think this is, I think we're in a very um, critical moment in this country, and I, I say that not in a in a vein of optimism because we've had 
critical moments in this country to where we could have stepped up and become better, but we didn't, right? Like it happens ever so often, right? Like it, it, it normally comes in moments of tragedy. Um, you know, 9-11, um, everybody except Muslim Americans, like were, we had this whole kumbaya thing, right? Uh, you know, the, the Boston, the Boston Marathon, like we, we came together, it seemed like, you know, we realized that um, there are more important things in life than bickering over somebody's skin tone and where they come from and money. Um, but right now, you know, I think um, with, with the murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and here locally, Mike Ramos and so many other people, um, it seems, it seems, and maybe I am a little bit optimistic, but it seems that um, a lot of our um, um, white brothers and sisters are realizing that maybe this thing um, is is something that we need to to, to reimagine, right? Like maybe safety um, in the American context is is something that's not afforded to everybody, which I would always argue that it's not. I think safety in American context is a very white concept that's only afforded to white and rich people. Um, so, and I agree with you completely. I think. The only way we get to this 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 place where America is great, um, where we get to this place where America lives up to the values and the Constitution and all the pretty things in that, is if we do the inner work, right? Like I think very often we want to challenge the systems and institutions, uh, but like a lot of us don't realize that it's us, the individuals, that uphold this this terrible um, system, right? Um, Really quick, I, I'll just share this to give an example of what I'm talking about. Um, somewhere on Instagram, um, somebody asked the question, women, what would you do if men didn't exist for a day, right? And the very simple answers that ladies were given uh, was very shocking and sad to me, right? Like a lot of, a lot of women were saying, I would just go walk in the park at night. Um, you know, I would, I, would, I would wear a swimsuit and go to the beach and swim. Um, and the fact that so many men preach and praise and say we love and respect women, but we don't really challenge the toxic, the toxic masculinity that we're probably surrounded by and that we don't like hold each other accountable is the reason that it still exists. So how, like, how, how can we get people to understand that, um, you know, if, if, if I'm safe, right, if I'm white, if I'm a white cis heterosexual male and, and I'm the only one that's safe, um, then really, I'm not safe, right? Like safety is something that we have to like share. It has to be something that everybody benefits from and 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 and, and gains from. So how do we get people to like actually uh, buy into that idea that if no if 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 one of us are not safe, none of us are. If the police come to a certain side of town to a certain neighborhood, and their very presence um, puts <laughs> you know the lives of the people in that in that community at risk, something has to change. Um, and if we know that policing, um, whether people want to believe it or not, like is literally born out of some are, are reiterated from some fashion of slave patrol, like how can we get people to rethink how we address crisis and harm when it happens, right? Because the fact of the matter is, Alec, and you know this more than anybody, police do not prevent crime. They come after the murder, they come after the sexual assault, they come after the terrible thing is done. So how do we get people more into a mindset of investing in communities and reducing harm, right? Which is the thing that we're afraid of, um, as opposed to investing in police, which is very reactionary. How do we become more proactive in building and creating um, safety, communal safety um, together, I guess. I, I just said a lot, I know there was a lot of shit, but Take and do with that what you can. <laughs> sure. I, I, I think you said a lot of really important things. So I'll try my best to, to give you my own thoughts about it. So I think at a very high level of generality, the problem is um, deeply cultural in this country. One of the most important accomplishments of um, the sort of American elite uh, neoliberal or capitalist order in the last, um, you know, century has been to give people this very individualistic uh, sort of cultural mentality. 
Um, it's about me. It's about me and my family and what we deserve, um, what we earn. Um, it's very different from other cultures around the country, around the world, and in in in, in world history, uh, which will have more of a collective mentality. And it's one of the I think central current features of our American society that we are divided up into these sort of individual atomized entities and families that look inward. Um, and we, we have destroyed a lot of the, the connections and relationships and fabrics that tie communities together. And because of that, people are just less invested in and less aware of and have fewer strong, healthy relationships with other people in the community. Um, and so I think that that, that has been, um, and I'm speaking like at a very high sort of like level of generality, but I think um, that is a, an intentional project of capitalists because they don't want people being able to band together and to organize together in any form of opposition, whether it's um, economic or social, because organized groups of people are harder to control and manage. Um, now, uh, so I think what we need to do is anything that builds connections in communities and builds solidarity is a subtle and profound um, act of resistance. Whether it's a community poetry group, an abolitionist reading group, um, you know, a sports team for kids, um, or things that are more political, right? Um, like organizing around police violence. Um, these are all things that bring people together on a shared experience and develop the kinds of relationships that, that we're gonna need. Um, second, I think, um, you know, it, it's, it's impossible to, to talk about like any, any of this without naming the fact that um, we have been, um, the system of mass punishment in this country is bipartisan. And um, in fact, um, most of it has been constructed by democratic politicians. You know, if you read James Foreman's book, Locking Up Our Own, for example, um, you'll, you'll see, um, although he, he, his, his comes at it, he comes at it less from like a um, sort of a Marxist analysis of like uh, sort of class and, and how class played a role in, in how many black politicians built the carceral state in many of America's uh, largest cities. But the point is basically that like a lot of um, uh, people on the so-called sort of liberal side of the, the spectrum actually, could, and, and, and another great book on this is Naomi Murakawa's uh, uh, book on how liberals built the sort of carceral state. And that's profoundly important because as we, as we start building energy around things like defunding the police and divesting from police and prisons and investing in, in communities, the, the biggest obstacle I think will be liberal democratic politicians. And in fact, they are the ones in control of most city governments. They are the ones who are in control of the police. They are the ones who, you know, in Louisville after Breonna Taylor's murder, they voted uh, to increase the police budget. In Houston, um, the black democratic mayor of Houston, Texas, um, Sylvester Turner um, spoke in, in all these platitudes at George Floyd's funeral. Um, George Floyd was from Houston, right? Um, spent time in the Harris County jail before he moved up to Minneapolis. The very next day, they added $20 million to the, to the Houston Police Department budget. That police department's budget is $960 million a year, okay? So um, we need to be able to educate and engage people with some political education to have them know the difference between someone like Sylvester Turner, who says words about police brutality at George Floyd's funeral, and then gives the Houston Police Department $20 million more money. We need people to be, be able to have a, a theory for how to distinguish between um, what are good things, good reforms and changes that are gonna reduce the system and, and bad things and which, which politicians are accountable to, to which interests and which aren't. And that's gonna be a really profound political challenge because um, you've got a lot of, of people who are very sophisticated, who know how to manipulate people and they know how to trick people into thinking, you know, Kamala Harris is, is ran for president as a criminal justice reformer, even though she'd spent her entire career as a mass incarceration warrior, a very zealous and harsh prosecutor. Um, there's a lot of, of, of attempts to um, um, uh, hide from people 
um, the, the, the reality. And so, you know, the, the number one thing that I say we need to do is, and this will kill two birds with one stone, both the first thing I was talking about and this thing is we need to organize with each other and do some political education with each other. And um, we need to be, uh, you know, uh, I don't see any other way around it, but deep relationship building um, centered around uh, uh, learning about the histories of how these systems have constantly been used to, to serve the interests of people who own things and, and white people. Uh, you know, I absolutely agree. And I, I have a question before I get to the very last question, because um, this is something that I struggle with, um, because I absolutely believe to my core, um, like there are some things that are just absolutely true to me, right? Like Beyonce is the greatest performer of all, of all time. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player of all time. And um, people, like we, each other are our greatest resource. And if I say that and I believe that, that means that I, one, I don't believe in throwing people away. And I believe there's some level of redemption in most people, if not all. Um, 2020 and Trump supporters make it very difficult for me to practice uh, that theory of mine, right? So in this, in this world of relationship building, where we, get, where we have these deep um, you know, relationships with people, does that mean that we like practice like this, abs like this absurd amount of civility? and like reach out to those people too? Or do we just reach out to the people that are like-minded um, because that's easier, right? And I'm, I'm not saying it's, don't do it because it's hard, but um, yeah, I, I just want your thoughts on it. Yeah, uh, sure. So you still, so you think even if LeBron wins the title this year, he's not? Oh, not no, 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 up there with absolutely Jordan. not, absolutely not. Interesting. But okay. we can talk. We can talk about yeah, that. Yeah, we'll talk offline <laughs> about that. Um, so, um, you know, I I think um, hmm, this is a tough one. Let me say this: um, there's a small, very small, relatively speaking, group of people. You know, one percent of this country um, owns uh, well over half of the wealth. Right? Um, there's a very small percent percentage of people who, who benefit from the current system. Most people don't. There's a very small group of people that control the media narrative, that own all of the, the media companies, um, that are actually pretty sophisticated in their understanding of how to manipulate. You know, this is what, what was laid bare in President Nixon's tapes about the war on drugs. They knew exactly what they were doing, and the Southern strategy, right? They knew exactly what they were doing. They were, they were lying about drugs, um, to manipulate white people into hating black people into voting with Nixon and the Republicans. Um, and they were using the war on drugs as a way of, of you know, changing the, the sort of political uh, party affiliations um, in this country. And so um, there's, there's a group of people like that, like the people on the Nixon tapes who understand and are manipulating. I don't actually think that's most Trump supporters. Um, I, I firmly believe that like most ordinary people are, are, um, are good, that all people are good, um, that all people are reachable, um, that they, have, they, are the, they are subjected to an overwhelming and unrelenting amount of misinformation and propaganda about our society and about the world. Um, I don't think most people um, are conniving, sort of unreachable, um, I think it's most politicians certainly are. I think it, it, it's a self-selecting profession and to get to the highest echelons of American politics, you have to be a certain kind of person for sure. Um, but I don't think it's most people. And I think most people are, um, want uh, to live in a world where everybody has the things that they and their families need to feel safe and to be able to flourish, um, to be safe. Most people don't want there to be violence of any kind in their community, violence by the police or otherwise. Um, I think they're mistaken about what the role police are playing um, and they don't sufficiently appreciate the, the amount of violence that police are inflicting on black communities. That, those, are, those are two different things. Um, so I haven't given up yet on, on a broader sort of public uh, awareness campaign. The second thing I'll say though is that like, we wouldn't even need to touch any of the Trump supporters if we actually got most people who identify as liberal to, to um, support policies that actually would 
um, help the black community and that actually would change the distribution of wealth in this country. Um, there's enough of them. And um, one of the, I think, profound uh, misunderstandings of, of most people in this criminal justice reform movement is that liberals have been their friend. Liberals have never been their friend in this, in this issue. Um, and that is because most liberals, um, uh, you know, have bought into many of the underlying myths um, that built the mass incarceration uh, bureaucracy. Most liberals have been complicit in that history of white supremacy. Um, most liberals have been complicit in um, the construction of the modern American policing state. And that's a very uncomfortable um, reality. And so I think um, I'm, in terms of your point about civility, I'm all about, you know, I don't want to swear at people or, or um, you know, uh, you know uh, insult people for no reason, but I do think we have to confront people and we have to hold people accountable for the pain that their actions and their beliefs and their policies are inflicting. And that's going to be uncomfortable for some people because some people are causing a lot of pain. And a lot of liberal allies and liberal politicians are going to have to be confronted um, by what, you know, um, even, even little things that they don't think cause harm, like moving their family to a different neighborhood um, and supporting certain kinds of investments in certain schools and not other schools, right? Um, you, you know, um, wanting to hold on to a certain version of their privatized for-profit health care. Um, there's all kinds you can name in every, in every area. Um, we need to engage people and radicalize them and make them understand that if they really do care about the black lives, if they do really care about um, inequality and, and, and suffering, they're not going to be standing idly by while the U.S. invades country after country after country and then uses those same military technologies and, 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 and uh, weapons that they got, they invented for those battlefields and bring them home to, to um, wage war against um, impoverished people of color in, in every uh, American city and town, which is what the military and the police departments are doing. So um, I think the most useful thing we can do um, is confront liberals with the gap between their stated beliefs and what they want to believe about themselves, what they say they believe about themselves, and what they actually do in their actions. I'm not writing off the other people, the, the Trump, I think we can reach them too, but I think it's a, it's a quicker, easier, task to educate and organize and engage the people who at least already say that they share uh, some of these same values, even if none of their actions in the criminal punishment system for the last 40 years have been consistent with those beliefs. I think that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I think this is the last question, barring there, uh, you know, if there are none from the audience. Um, I don't think people have had their coffee yet. <laughs> um, but yeah, for people that are watching and they want to be a part of the change and they want to do the things to bring lasting change to their communities um, or to the country, um, what's your advice for, for us? How do, we, how do we do that? What does that look like? How do we build or start building um, this world that we want where everybody's safe, everybody's happy um, and people have the things that they need? joining us and I'll pass it over to Chelsea. The answer to that Thank question you so much, is heavily dependent on um, who you are and what your background is and what your skills are. You know, if you're a person who's been in directly impacted by the system, the answer is quite different from if you're a person who's, who's been fortunate enough never to have been involved in the system. Uh, if you're a person with wealth, uh, the answer is also different, right? Um, so there are a number of different ways. And I encourage you, I think the most important thing for everybody is to, to, to educate themselves and the people in their lives about the system from a critical perspective. You know, reading people like Angela Davis and Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Miriam Kaba, all of whom you can find at that website that I, I listed before, um, all of whom I rely on a great deal in, in, in my book, Usual Cruelty, and in the article that, that Ben posted in the chat box that I wrote about the police recently in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor's killings. Read, read, read. Um, and then also think about where are you expo where are you getting your news from? Where what news sources are you exposing yourself to? Um, because most of the media is designed to perpetuate a certain worldview, and so you should be finding people, whether it's on social media or or in sources like the ones I've just recommended, um, and find out where those where you you can get a consistent and more critical uh, view of the news, whether it's 
you know, general publications like truthout.org or democracy now, um, or, or there's some really great local independent news um, sources in, in many major places around the country. And so just be, be, be very, um, or there, you know, there's uh, other great national magazines like current affairs magazine, which I really love. Um, so there's, there's lots of, um, but, but be intentional about what you're exposing yourself to. Um, and then um, find out ways to get involved. No matter where you live, uh, all over the country, there are court watching programs. My mother who is on this Zoom call right now is retired and, and joined a local court watching program in Pittsburgh, which is really amazing. Um, there are uh, ba community bail funds you can get involved with. There are um, organizers like you, um, Chaz, who, who, who have all kinds of different ways people can get involved and plugged in. There are participatory defense hubs now popping up in a number of different cities. Um, so there's lots of ways to get involved. There's groups working on community land trusts and worker owned co-ops in, in many cities around the country. So find out who's doing more radical work, who's working on, on, in many cities now, there's campaigns to stop the construction of new jails. That's something you can get involved with, right? you're going to start meeting people. You're going to start making friends and building relationships with other like-minded people. And then you'll get involved. And, and then it, depending on what skills you have to offer, if you're a computer programmer or if you're an artist, you know, you're going to offer like different things to whoever you're, you're organizing with. And so um, I think it's really about all of us intentionally thinking about what skills and interests in, in, in do I have? And maybe it's just my time, but there's someone who needs your time too, right? So um, anyway, that's, that's, those are my thoughts. And, and I want to thank you for this really great discussion and, and to everyone who was involved in inviting me and, and I hope maybe we can plan on, on doing this a similar version of this talk next year in Charlottesville. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely hope so, man. Um, I really wanted to be there and hopefully next year is just a better year. I mean, like this year has completely sucked um, and we haven't even got through the worst of it yet. <laughs> you know, I don't know what November is gonna do, but um, Alec, thank you so much. Look forward to talking to you more. Um, look forward to working with you in this movement as we get to a world with um, better public safety and safety. Um, and I'll turn it over, to, I think, to Ben, right? Yeah, that works. Thank you both for your, for your time and for your uh, positive affirmations for the future, both for our festival and you guys coming, making it to Charlottesville and also for um, communities across the country right now. I um, really appreciate you sharing all these resources and insights. Um, we kind of teased a session tomorrow around um, sort of demystifying, um, defunding and divesting. Um, Chaz is gonna be a part of that session, as well as Don Blagrove from Emancipate North Carolina and Jasmine Heiss from Bear Institute of Justice. We're super excited for that. Continue to peel back the layers um, this week um, with our criminal justice reform focus. Um, thank you, Alec. Thank you, Chaz. Appreciate the work that you're doing um, and appreciate everyone for being here. Um, we've got a session at four today with some uh, local prosecutors from Virginia talking about um, what they're doing uh, for the movement from, from their seats of power. Um, so we're excited for that. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, this session was brought to you by Seville Weekly. Um, and, if, and if you enjoyed this session, uh, please consider being a contributing member to our foundation. Um, so we can continue to do this work. Um, you can go to tomtomfoundation.org. And that's all I'll say. Thank you again, everyone. Um, and we'll see you soon.